uh, invitation. So before starting the keynote topic, uh, if you may, I would like to say a few words uh, about the conference uh, and the organization. So first of all, uh, I would really thank to uh, TIIKM uh, for their wonderful organization uh, and the details uh, in having the organization as far as I can witness. Uh, and Professor uh, Ranavera for his kind invitation uh, and chairing this uh, conference. I'm very uh, honored to share the floor uh, with him. And the uh, hosting academic uh, organizations here. Uh, so I'm very happy to be under their umbrella. Uh, that's, that's my first time in Sri Lanka, but I hope that it would not be the last. Uh, for, so we are really looking uh, for the further academic collaborations. Uh, so, uh, to start uh, is something uh, in the conferences, but uh, we, people always remember how it ends. So I just uh, hope that these two days will be with full participation, enthusiasm, and uh, with your quotes and challenging remarks. Uh, so in today's world, to share the academic knowledge is very important, and we share the knowledge with less than milliseconds because we all have these you know, wonderful devices, we are just hooked to the uh, network and so on. So I would really love to hear your comments, participation and so on. Uh, so uh, the success comes from sharing. Uh, also, look forward to the uh, third and the fourth uh, one of these international conferences uh, with uh, more participations uh, coming from uh, all through the world. and. Uh, let me say a few words about the topic and so on. Uh, so, uh, uh, in the morning uh, inauguration and opening speeches, uh, both the professor and uh, the TIAKM, uh, they just talk about food safety, quality, security. Hope that this is good luck. <laughs> uh, defense and processing. So, coming from, I uh, hope that we're coming from food background, uh, all we work is. Uh, for the favor of humankind and so on. Uh, but basically, uh, what I just work with uh, majorly, one is non-thermal processes, and the second one is, I say, food safety paradigm, because none of these terms alone uh, is sufficient to cover what we require as human beings, uh, because we have to add the term of food defense also, uh, which is the intentional adulteration or uh, effect or just uh, any uh, malicious effect to the food system. So uh, the importance of the terms like sustainability uh, have been introduced, safety, quality is introduced. I would like to add uh, new, new two terms like industry 4.0, uh, which is uh, heavily gaining importance throughout the world in Europe and the States and food industry or food technology, food processing uh, cannot be devoted alone from this uh, important, let's say, implications and developments. Uh, because our main aim is to convert the raw materials to the processed ones. Uh, but uh, we know that as human beings, uh, we don't desire foods as harshly processed or processed with heavily with additives and so on. So people are much more health conscious nowadays. So as uh, food people, academics, processors, and so on, we have to take their demands, uh, the industry especially, into consideration. Uh, on the other side, we know that our resources are scarce. Uh, population will increase, world population will increase. We don't have uh, excess capacity in the food system in the world. But at the same time, we are wasting food. I mean, food waste is still a very highly developing problem uh, worldwide. So on the one side, we know that there is a dead end, but on the other side, we are really uh, not generously consuming our resources. Uh, Sri Lanka being a 21 million country, an island, so most probably depending heavily on exports and imports of food. Uh, and we can think the world as highly interconnected. Uh, there's one example, for example, America's main leading import of coffee producer is Canada, where, as you can know, in Canada there is no single coffee tree. So it just gives the globalization and so on in terms of food, so we don't know the basic source of the food. So cutting the short story, sorry, long story short, we have a lot of things to think, discuss, 
uh, and it is not uh, under the sole responsibility of a single discipline like food scientists or food engineers because there are a lot of side disciplines like health, agriculture, veterinary, sustainability, economics, even international relations. Uh, so we have to be open for the new insights, new knowledge, new participations and you know, being an academician is uh, never to say I have enough and I know everything. What I say each time is I don't know anything. I'm here to learn, share the knowledge and get some insights. So having said that, uh, I would like to start the uh, keynote uh, topic. Hope that it would find uh, some interest on you. Uh, I just look at the audience and so on and decided to, uh, this is a recently finished master's study uh, from our uh, research group. Uh, so milk is one of the basic commodities and how we just treat uh, milk uh, is in different ways. So uh, have you ever heard about uh, donkey's milk? So it's a recent uh, uh, commodity being to increase uh, its interest and value uh, I would say in the milk uh, sector. So uh, I'm going to just combine it with a new technology uh, that I'm an expert on, uh, working having my PhD on uh, non-thermal processes and high hydrostatic pressure. Here I will just keep it on the minimum level within the time allocated for me, but tomorrow uh, in the workshop uh, I will have detailed and longer uh, scientific uh, information shared with you based on high hydrostatic pressure. Uh, so we know that milk and dairy products are really important uh, parts of our diet. So that tea, coffee and milk is uh, our uh, daily, uh, let's say, commodity. And we are lucky if we can find it in liquid form, uh, because even in civilized countries, sometimes you cannot find it in liquid form, so you have to just have the powder form. And it's a, a good way of, uh, let's say, um, keeping it but always uh, the taste and other things are lost. Uh, we use different uh, animal sources that got served for us. Uh, oops. Uh, and about donkey's milk, uh, of course we are not the pioneering, pioneering uh, in literature, so a lot of people have done uh, important study, uh, studies and have found the, let's say, uh, possibly adverse effects, good effects, based on or as compared to other uh, milk sources. So having looked at, we said, uh, what might be those properties uh, that are overwhelming or advantageous to the existing milk types? So basically we use cow's milk, uh, sheep, some part camel. Uh, goat milk and goat milk products are very prone, uh, even in Turkey and in the, in the world. And uh, we have realized that donkey's milk in Turkey also has uh, developing some interest. But there is a difficult dilemma which prevents the overspread, uh, let's say, consumption. So we based on that one. So it is antimicrobial, anti-inflammatory, antioxidant, anti-hypertensive, anti-carcinogenic, and anti-proliferative effects. Okay, so having said so, Let's look at the values and if we compare them with cow, sheep, and goat mix, which are basically consumed. And I'm not forgetting this one. Every newborn, everyone, we are just very thankful, uh, appreciateful to our uh, mom. So we start with having and tasting human's milk. And of course, it's the most valuable and naive and the perfect product. So when we combine, oh, sorry, I'm sorry, compare it with those types, of course, we don't consume human milk as commercially, but uh, you know, that's the best taste and the composition we have. Uh, so the composition seems to be uh, comparatively okay. So uh, what is the basic problem? Uh, the problem is this lysozyme and lactoferrin are the main proteins of donkey milk that provide the beneficial health effects. Uh, very basically, you might be uh, aware of that, but just to be in the notes of the presentation. Lysozyme is an enzyme which has bactericidal effects, which inhibits the growth of bacteria, and sometimes we use it for microbial safety purposes. 
and the lactoferrin is an iron binding protein that inhibits the broad spectrum of the bacteria and some of yeast species and fungi species. So these two are very beneficial, which are found naturally in the donkey's milk. So the idea popped up that if we can keep them for the wider consumption in the milk. Uh, so if you look at the general, uh, so the numbers might change, but generally just uh, throughout the world, cow is the main used animal for the milk purposes. But of course, we have the widespread depending on the benefits coming from the other types of milk sources. So our aim is not to replace the cow's milk, which is heavily industrialized. But you know, diversification is very important in food industry and also to keep the food safety. Uh, if you compare the milk that was obtained from the other sources, the donkey milk was found to have lower uh, foodborne pathogen, uh, sorry, uh, lower microbial count, and there were no microbial uh, pathogens in donkey's milk. So what this pressure, uh, as I said, uh, this is like a preliminary intro uh, for those of you who are not familiar. So it's a basic uh, heat enemy system, I could say. We say non-thermal, but uh, we use pressure time and temperature simultaneously in a three-dimensional system. Temperature is used, but at a lower ranges as compared to conventional pasteurization temperatures, like room temperature or 30, 40 degrees max. Uh, so it's a 3D process, and whenever we say heat treatment, pasteurization, freezing, or other things, most of the food processing techniques uh, are a combination of time and temperature. So basically, we are seeing the food industry as a majority way in a 2D. So we are just bringing a third dimension in the name of pressure. Of course, there are other technologies which brings the third dimension. Uh, so what are the advantages? You can obtain food products that are safer to consumers. So you have to give the insight of uh, that safer term or safety terms. They might have longer shelf lives or they might not need cold chain. Uh, and you might, because you're using lower temperatures, you may not affect the sensorial and nutritional quality parameters uh, adversely or negatively, as was done with thermal treatment. So this is a lab-scale pressure equipment that we have in, our, uh, um, in my pressure laboratory. Uh, so we can apply pressures up to uh, 6,000 atmospheres. So the atmosphere we're living is one atmosphere, so we can go to up to 6,000 times higher to that one. We generally create the pressure by compressing water, which is abundant and free of charge. Generally, you can even use tap water. Unlike heat treatment, if any one of you are working with heat transfer problems and so on, we have the slowest heating point, shape, size problems, so in pressure, eventually you don't have any of those problems and they are really uh, bringing an advantage. So of course you can think about food safety. Generally you can just eliminate or inactivate vegetative cells, yeasts and molds and most foodborne pathogens like Staph, Listeria, Salmonella and E. coli. Uh, generally cost efficient, so this is debatable which is not the whole topic of today's session but uh, you know, if we admire and we would like to buy a food product and we believe that it would bring additional benefits, cost is not a problem. So think about your uh, expenditure habits. So that is debatable, but uh, for the record. Uh, so what were our aims? Uh, because heat treatment oops, sorry, uh, at high temperature causes irreversible damage, we say that Let's use less temperature, but we have to just put something else to reach to our aim, which is pressure. And basically, if you just visualize, it's a very good resolution. So this is the raw fresh donkey milk, uh, fresh obtained from the farm. If we just heat treat in a water bath, uh, low temperature, low time, a little bit high temperature all time, so you see the phase separation and even at 85 degrees you can see that we cannot consider as milk. We have coagulation, the uh, you know, 
phase and texture changes and your sensorial responses even by seeing without testing you will just reject it. So if that is the problem it is obvious that you cannot heat treat it but you have to uh, make it available as a commodity to the uh, human, to the consumers. What to do? Uh, okay, that is the sensory thing and at the same time these two uh, advantages uh, Items or the nutrients or the, uh, I would say, plus terms are unfortunately affected adversely by heat. So it is obvious scientifically that uh, this product is not suitable for conventional pasteurization temperature. And actually that is the reason in Turkey and elsewhere uh, what the producers do, they charge, they overcharge. Uh, nowadays the price per a liter is around um, fifteen dollars per liter, because the producer just uh, puts in to the cold chain like ice cassettes and so on. Uh, it has a very short shelf life. You cannot send it by cargo and so on. So people go and take in a very close distance. Once the uh, temperature is abused, you cannot have these nutritional value. Okay, so we said that let's use or search the literature. Uh, and we found different treatments in literature and among this we have selected pressure because I was working on it, we have the device uh, ready and we have the conventional uh, technique that can be used to be carried out. So what is the effect of the pressure treatment on the stabilities of antimicrobial proteins such as lysozyme and lactoferrin? Can we extend the shelf life without the treatment? we just refer to conventional pasteurization time temperature combination. Can we preserve the structural characteristics? And having said so, we can increase, or if we can increase the availability, uh, even if it's not readily commercialized, maybe the uh, milk producers can have such systems and then without needing, hopefully, cold chain distribution systems, they can just send their products maybe by cargo and so on, uh, because you don't need cold chain. So we just supplied the raw uh, donkey's milk from a local farm, uh, which they were commercially and selling and sending uh, donkey milk to the nationwide. Uh, and we kept them at four degrees and storage under pressure treatment. Uh, we measured the basic amic parameters just to uh, combine and compare with the literature values. And the values represented here fall uh, within the ranges uh, that was presented in a few slides uh, before with the literature findings. That is an expected issue and we said that at least our milk just before experimentation is still uh, with the same quality parameters. Uh, so that is the milk just before the experimentation, donkey's milk. Uh, so we have selected a three factorial design, three different pressure values combined with temperatures. The highest temperature range we use is 45 degrees and after 15 minutes. So how we decide, we always ask the students how we decide to these parameters, uh, how well you just so this is from literature values and our priory knowledge that we work with other uh, milks and so on, like cow's milk and other fruit juices or liquid system. And the second idea is we don't want to go above, uh, let's say, 400 to 500 megapascal. Of course, it is again a process, though you have lower temperatures. So we would like to keep always the processing parameters as low as possible as a rule of thumb. So you can see there's a 3D concept, you apply pressure, temperature, and the time simultaneously in the equipment. Uh, we'll cover 27 trials. And of course, we'll compare the results with uh, that of non-treated raw milk and laboratory scale, uh, commercial, I would say, pasteurization treated milk or pasteurized milk because 
what happens if you just pasteurize even though there is this serum separation and so on. Uh, we just look at the chemical composition. Of course, the lysozyme and lactoferrin determination and the microbiological analysis. So here we just uh, worked about pH, titratable acidity, uh, nitrogen content, Caldwell method, fat content, dry matter. Uh, we use uh, HPLC, uh, chromatographic method, and of course total uh, uh, aerobic mesopolic count uh, because we didn't expect any foodborne pathogens. First we have tested and there were no pathogens and we said that let's see only the total count. Uh, because what people usually consume is just uh, untreated milk in the cold chain, like fresh, raw. Uh, okay, so we didn't expect any problems there, but talking about food safety, we have to be sure. Uh, so, for those of you who are familiar with chromatograms, uh, so uh, you might understand better, but basically it is self-explanatory. Uh, if you look at raw donkey's milk sample, after 500 megapascals, 25 degrees, 15 minutes, and after heat treatment, uh, so you see that some bands are missing. So what those bands refer to? So this is lysozyme, this is lactoferrin, and this is beta lactoglobulin. So we have to keep these uh, with the pressure terms. After pressure treatment, there is a decrease in lysozyme and lactoferrin concentration, but they are still there. Uh, but if you even, have I done something? maybe you can I hope that I didn't do anything <laughs> okay we, we sorry Okay, well that's fixed. I would say something about the, the pressure. Uh, water is generally thought to be incompressible and we just teach like that in our food engineering and transport phenomena courses, which is correct, uh, but it is incompressible under atmospheric pressure. So if you increase the pressure, you can decrease the volume, uh, which is not my finding. It has been known for over two centuries from Le Chatelier principle. So if you increase the pressure up to four, five thousand atmospheres, you can decrease the volume of water up to 20 or 22 percent. So what you need is just a flexible package. So any, any food package that we use today, other than glass of course, which can resist the volume change is okay. So, uh, yeah. So, Turning back to our discussion, uh, with heat treatment, so you would remember the picture, we have serum separation and we were rejected from our sensory, let's say, responses, uh, but even you have total destruction of lysozyme and sharp decrease in lactoferrin in uh, the concentration values after 85 degrees. So it's a proof that you can use, you cannot use or you should not use, actually, people can use it, uh, but all the beneficiary uh, items in that food product is lost and maybe as a consumer you have been uh, adulterated if you don't know these reasons. So what we have done, so our initial hypothesis uh, was using this refractorial design with at different pressures but at the same temperature and for the same time uh, which did not significantly change the levels of uh, the components. So you can just compare with the previous one. So lysozyme, lactoferrin, and beta-lactoglobulin is there. Uh, so let's see the 
other treasure results at 200, 400, and 500 megapascals. So uh, we can use the ANOVA and so on and compare the results, but on one side you have total destruction. On the other side, bingo, you win the lottery academically, you're just happy in terms of master's thesis, uh, if you're having the experiments, so that's a success. So it is there. So what we have done, uh, we also did preheating of samples at 35 and 45 degrees in combination with the applied temperature of pressure treatment and check the effects. So that slightly pretreatment up to 35 and 45 degrees Celsius actually, uh, we have seen that there is an increase at the levels and activities of lysozyme and lactoferrin over here. Uh, yeah. So we have to have a uniform product and process temperature which has been taught in our lectures. So that's a proof of that one. Uh, so if you have the product at a cooler temperature than the process temperature, you might have uh, diffraction. Uh, so, if you want to see the lysozyme loss for each of these treatments, of course, this needs uh, ANOVA and the statistical uh, results as compared individually the uh, per sampling or per treatments because each one is a combination of pressure, time, and temperature within, within the range study. So, you can see the percent lysozyme loss even with the individual pressure, time, temperature treatment. Uh, and from there, you might just come and select at best. I wouldn't say optimal because you need to have other experiments for that one, but you can have a, let's say, best PTT combination and to offer uh, for commercialization. So what does the uh, table say? Lysozyme loss increases with increasing pressure values. Okay, it is good, but we have to criticize also uh, beyond the uh, processing conditions. We have minim minimum lactoferrin loss, which is obtained at 25 and 35 degrees, and there is no significant difference between the temperature treatments of 25 and 35. That is good. Why not to go a lower temperature than a higher temperature? Because again, you use sources for that one. So, shortly saying, you can achieve uh, minimum loss under pressure, you can almost say room temperature, at room temperature. Uh, the lactoferrin loss, we have a short summary on that one. It increases with increasing pressure values. Uh, okay, the table is uh, similarly structured, percent lactoferrin loss. And the minimum lactoferrin loss is obtained at 25 and 35 degrees. And again, we don't have any significant uh, difference in between.